Hello, we're back, lecture 3C. Okay, so you look at the readings list here, seems like there's a lot, really not that much, okay? You know, in fact, the last four or so are, are pretty much very short. They're all relating to the same topic, which are the characteristics of water. So don't get intimidated by the, uh, by the reading list. The other thing is that we don't really need to have a 2.9 there. So um, let me, Go ahead and kind of draw an X right through 2.9. 2.9 is important. I mean, if you want to read it now, go ahead. But we'll be talking about chemical reactions in an upcoming lecture, right? So uh, today, the focus is on things that are not covalent bonds. Um, they're ionic bonds, but um, more importantly for the focus for today's discussion, uh, we want to be talking about hydrogen bonds. What are they? Why are they important? What do they form? Um, and so let me move over to the other uh, thing that I typically share, which is the textbook. Okay. And, uh, and yeah, you can see that uh, there's a whole section on ionic bonds. Uh, this one is actually pretty easy. I, I'm not thinking that we need to go over it all that much. I think, you know, certainly happy to um, you know, give you the basic rundown here. Okay. Um, you know that sodium. Um, and A has a tendency to become sodium ion, right? Sodium ion is a cation, right? Our cations have a positive charge, uh, whereas uh, chlorine, the atom, is unstable because it's got one uh, vacancy in its outermost shell. And, and, and so um, you could sort of think about this. I mean, if we actually did have a sodium atom coming close to a chlorine atom, not that this ever really happens this way, okay, but uh, let's say it did. Um, the sodium would be reaching its stable state by taking away its 11th electron, yeah, while chlorine would take on an extra electron to complete its valence shell. But chlor chlorine is going to have a negative charge. It'll be an anion. And, and if you have a positive charge and a negative charge, those two things attract each other, right? And so there's this ionic attraction, magnetic attraction between particles that are negative and particles that are positive, right? Nothing too special about that, right? In fact, that's kind of the, uh, the theme that we continue with as we start talking about um, hydrogen bonds. Right? Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, when it comes to uh, understanding chemistry, uh, when you have salts, salts are basically ionic. Uh, compounds where if you take a salt, uh, the water molecules will come and dissolve it, and you'll have these sodium ions and chloride ions uh, floating free, right? And, and by the way, I'll, I'll preview what happens if we have a sodium ion. Um, the reason why it's able to float around freely in water is because we have water molecules, O, H, O, H. And notice I'm drawing the O's pointing in the general direction of the sodium ion. And, and that's because the delta minus, remember that, that um, negative, weak negative charge, it results because we have a polar covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen. Um, the delta minuses uh, allow the water molecules to interact nicely with the positive. Uh, sodium ion, and so uh, sodium ions can basically float around freely in water. Water is basically carrying the sodium ions into solution, right? It does the same thing with chloride ions, only in the case of chloride ions, because it has a negative charge, it would be the H's that are pointing toward the chloride ions. Remember, chlorides have a positive, I mean, chlorides have a negative charge, but the hydrogen end of this OH bond, this polar covalent bond, is going to have a delta positive charge. And so you have this weak interaction between the delta, delta positive on the hydrogen and the chloride ion. And, and, and this type of interaction, uh, we call it a, a dipole ion interaction. You know, this is the ion, it's got a full ionic charge. This is the dipole because we've got two dipole. Uh, uh, and so delta minus is on this side. We don't have to have that point to anything in particular here, but we need to have the other 
pole, positive pole pointing in the general direction of the chloride ion and, and close enough to, so that we can actually have this interaction, right? It's, it's kind of like sodium ions and chloride ions are carried into solution. They're carried into a watery world because all these water molecules like to come in and interact and play with the ions. Okay? And, and, and uh, I, that's a little bit of a preview, but it's a worthwhile thing for us to talk about here. Okay? Um, moving forward now, um, let me erase this. Um, moving into the next chapter, um, hydrogen bonds are kind of a central topic for us in Bio 110, biology general, be, generally because of the way that, um, uh, well, they're important for lots of things. Um, you know, they, you know, they, uh, they result in um, the, um, among other things, right? So it's not just restricted to uh, what's drawn on the board right here, and you can, you can see it on the screen, but uh, we have things like DNA strands. Um, DNA is a double-stranded molecule, and the strands are zipped together. They're held together in place by hydrogen bonds, right? Um, protein structure. is stabilized in a very basic way um, by hydrogen bonds occurring within the protein molecule itself. Okay, uh, and, and so what we want to do here is just kind of define what a hydrogen bond is and illustrate hydrogen bonds in another really significant um, scenario that involves hydrogen bonds, interactions between water molecules. Water molecules interacting with other water molecules, which is basically all the molecules you have there in a glass of water, right? So water molecules like to interact with each other because they've got these, um, you see the dotted line here? This dot, 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 okay. It's a dotted line because we want to distinguish that from a covalent bond, right? And so um, frequently, if you see a dotted line in the textbook, it's gonna be uh, representing a hydrogen bond. And a hydrogen bond always uh, connects um, the delta plus, the, 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 remember that very, very weak charge on the hydrogen end of a polar covalent bond with another atom, atomic nucleus, and, uh, and some other structure and, and some other thing that's going to have a negative charge or even a delta negative charge. Again, so in this particular case, you have the oxygen nucleus of this water molecule up here, and the oxygen side is going to have a negative charge on it and it's going to be weakly attractive to the delta positive charge that's there on the hydrogen end of this molecule's polar covalent bond, right? And so these, these water molecules, they have um, a tendency to stick together like little magnets do, right? If, if you ever had a toy, I mean, they, they can see, get these things on Amazon, you can make little packages of magnets. And if you throw all the magnets together, they'll stick together really tightly. And, and, and water molecules are kind of doing the same thing because each water molecule is equipped with two negative ends and two positive ends. And so if you could visualize each water molecule being this tiny magnet, you'll realize that these things are gonna be sticking to each other. Okay. Um, the, the stickiness is not gonna be terribly strong because right? the hydrogen bond is weak compared to a covalent bond. It's only like five, maybe a little more than 5% of the strength of a covalent bond, right? So this polar covalent bond here is much, much stronger than the hydrogen bond. And because water molecules are moving around in all different directions, they, they have their energy. They're gonna, these hydrogen bonds are gonna break and, uh, and this bond is gonna disappear as soon as this water molecule over here starts charging in the direction up and to the left, right? Um, but that, that doesn't matter because there's gonna be another water molecule that will come in and form a hydrogen bond with the first water molecule, the molecule that's there in the center, right? And so because we have this, kind of this fluid magnet material, water, um, we're gonna be having a lot of the completely interesting properties of water, okay? 
Okay, so a couple of things. I'm going to go back to my whiteboard share, and um, I can get there quickly, so you don't have to. Uh, okay, uh, we'll um, kind of go over my little agenda here. Um, ionic bonds. You know what ionic bonds are. If we, we've already talked about the formation of ions in the last lecture. We talked about the formation of delta minus and delta plus charges at the ends of a polar covalent bond. And a hydrogen bond in particular is where you have the delta plus on a hydrogen interacting by this weak attractive force with uh, negatively charged structures elsewhere, right? So hydrogen bonds are, uh, are, are much weaker than, um, than covalent bonds because, well, let's see, let's see down further on the agenda, we just said that the strength of a hydrogen bond is weak compared to covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are not likely to break because the atomic nuclei are moving their own kinetic energy. The hydrogen bonds are going to do that pretty, pretty readily, right? And the reason for that is the charge on, uh, part of the reason for that is that the charge of a delta plus is not really that, it's not close to the strength of the positive charge on, say, a, a sodium ion, right? Uh, the delta minus that you have on the oxygen end of a polar covalent bond is going to be negative, but it's not going to be nearly as strong as, say, the full-on charge of, uh, of a chloride ion, right? A chloride ion is going to carry a full negative charge. That's the charge of one electron. It's going to have one electron too many, and that electron is going to carry a negative charge that is much stronger compared to the delta minus charge you would have in uh, on, on the oxygen end of, of water molecule, right? And so because the, uh, the the strength of these delta positive and delta negative charges is weak, we're not gonna have a very strong uh, attraction between structures that are bonded together with hydrogen bonds. Uh, but they're still gonna be there, right? And, and they're gonna be affecting our, um, our, our proteins are going to be affecting our uh, nucleic acids, DNA, in very important ways. And uh, not only that, we're going to be uh, thinking about the interaction of water molecules with other water molecules. Okay. And so let's just kind of go through this. Okay. Uh, okay oh, first, now, before we go any further, uh, do not, okay, this is a, a standard uh, mistake of students, do not think that a hydrogen bond is just any covalent bond with a hydrogen, right? I mean, you, you, typical uh, rookie mistake is to say, okay, well, here is a molecule of methane, and you've got hydrogens that are bonded to the carbons, okay? Each one of these bonds connecting the carbon and the hydrogen is a hydrogen bond, right? No, no, absolutely not. This is not a hydrogen bond. This is a covalent bond. And a covalent bond is a different thing, right? There's actually a pair of electrons that are being shared there. And that bond is much, much stronger than any hydrogen bond will ever be. And, and so don't, you know, hydrogen atoms form covalent bonds too, right? And when that happens, it's not a hydrogen bond, right? Hydrogen bond specifically refers to that kind of weak interaction between the uh, delta plus that we have on a hydrogen and something else, this dotted line to something else is going to have a negative charge. Okay. Okay. Now we'll go back to pictures pretty soon. Okay. Um, uh, next, hydrogen bonds are super important forces for biology. I explain that uh, briefly because we're going to be talking about the structure of DNA and you know, nucleic acids in the next um, module. And we'll be talking about the structure of protein. So we'll be revisiting these issues again later, and I want you to remember what uh, the, what hydrogen bonds are, and uh, and so when we talk about them later on, it will make sense. Um, I've already given you an, an example of how water molecules are going to be interacting with ions, right? Um, uh, right. I think that was the uh, the picture that I showed you where you had a chloride ion, chloride ion, which is an anion, a negative one, it's going to be interacting with the hydrogen ends of water molecules. 
another H there, H, O, H, because the delta plus is very weak positive charges on the hydrogen end of this polar covalent bond are going to make that, ne that positive charge weakly attractive to anything with negative charge. And that might be an ion. Okay, So we could have interaction of water molecules with ions. Uh, I think, well, explain to me why does a salt, table salt, NaCl, I dissolve in water, right? Well, it's because the water molecules are coming in and associating with each ion individually. So the water molecules say, hey, chloride ion, come and play with me, come and play with us. And the chloride ion will go and play with the water molecules. So they'll do the same thing to sodium ions because sodium ions have a positive charge, right? If it were just sodium, or if it were just anything that didn't have a charge, then water molecules would not have this tendency to interact with them. Okay? And then, so what we're going to find is that um, you know, things that are water soluble will be the ones that will be forming these um, interactions with water molecules, these hydrogen bonds. Okay? And so, uh, so likewise, uh, and again, this is a topic that we'll just briefly mention now, uh, molecules that themselves have polar covalent bonds, like um, C, uh, let's just do C, H, O, H, right? Okay, so this is C, H, 3, O, H, right? This is the chemical formula. This bond right here, this bond right here is a polar bond, right? Because the oxygen is pulling more strongly on the electrons shared it's shared with hydrogens. And so we have a delta minus charge here, delta plus charge here. And yeah, so this molecule, methanol, is also going to be drawn into solution uh, by water. Right? The water molecules are going to come in and say, hey, I'm going to interact with it here. What the uh, H pluses, the Hs are going to be associating with the delta minus. The Os are going to be associating with the delta plus because we have a weak positive interaction there. These dotted lines will be shown in the textbook, maybe if you get the right picture, and uh, you'll uh, completely understand how polar molecules, molecules that have polar covalent bonds are going to be um, interacting. And, and so now let's go back to our picture that shows the interaction with water molecules and remind ourselves what that is, and then we'll kind of scroll through the textbook and talk about these remarkable properties of water and, uh, and how they're important for living systems. Okay, back on uh, chemical basis of life, or I uh, don't remember what, uh, it's chapter 2.8, right? So on 2.8, uh, hydrogen bonds are weak bonds, and, and this picture was really nicely kind of you know, reminding Remind yourself of what's going on here, right? Um, yeah, we've got a polar covalent bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen, and that results in a plus charge on the hydrogen and a negative charge on the oxygen. And, uh, and that results in these tendencies of water molecules to interact with each other, right? And so um, 2.9, uh, this is one I told you that we can skip because we'll be talking about it later. And then for 2.11, 2.12, and no, 2.10, 11, 12, and 13, we're just talking about the, the features of water that are there because of this tendency of water molecules to stick to each other, right? like cohesion. Right? Cohesion is uh, the tendency of water molecules to just be, be sticky, right? Um, if you have uh, water on a two, in a two-dimensional layer, uh, like at the surface where the water creates uh, a surface layer with an air with air on top of it. The water molecules interlock with each other to create like an, I, mean, if you have, I wish I could show you this with my hands. The, the water molecules basically fit together so that uh, they create this um, almost like a shell, right? Uh, that's even a little bit more dense than the water molecules in the three-dimensional uh, 
solution. We know that water molecules are sticky to each other, but when you've got water molecules at the interface with air, the surface of the water, okay, the water molecules are fitting together even more tightly, and that creates a little shell on top of the water that might not be strong enough to support you, but if you're light enough, you could actually you know, you know, walk on top of that. You know, this water strider, it, it's almost like it's, it's got a membrane on top of the water that it can walk on, even though it, its body, it's not floating, right? It's, its body is actually more dense than the water. I mean, if it were, if you were to push this water strider under, it would sink to the bottom. Right? But because it's relatively light, its, it's overall weight is light enough to not poke through the membrane of the surface of the water, right? And, and so that's it's kind of a neat thing. Um, uh, the tendency of water to form beads is uh, another characteristic it's described here. Um, another feature of water that's really important is uh, the, the way that it moderates temperature. Okay? Now, uh, for some reason, the textbook decided to give uh, a sweaty uh, player, it looks like a player of American football, uh, who's using evaporative cooling to cool off. That's kind of uh, one application, uh, but thing to to, to you, know, you can uh, hopefully you can relate to this. Hopefully, you want, you know based on your personal experience that if you live very close to the coast, because most of you are local to California, if you live uh, coastally, like in Oceanside or in Carlsbad, okay, uh, the temperature fluctuations are far lower compared to what you would experience if you were to live inland, like in uh, Temecula or Valley Center, right? Uh, it gets a lot hotter on the hot days in Temecula, it gets a lot colder in the cold uh, nights in Temecula compared to what you would experience out in the beach in Oceanside, right? Now, why is that? Well, it, it's because of the proximity to the Pacific Ocean, right? The Pacific Ocean is this um, body of water that is going to be absorbing heat when when the sun is shining, and it's going to be releasing heat when it gets cold. In other words, you know, the 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 um, you know, this massive body of water is going to absorb heat and release heat. There's going to be less temperature fluctuation in water than there would be in air. Air molecules don't have that characteristic of stickiness, and it's going to take relatively little energy to heat up air. It takes a lot of energy to heat up water. In other words, water can absorb lots of heat. And at the same time, if the water is warmer compared to the air, it can release a lot of heat during the time when the air temperature drops. So uh, yeah, I mean, one of the advantages living in coastal California is, because, is, is that you don't have to deal with the super hot days or super cold nights. Temperature stays relatively moderate. Okay? And that's, that's kind of an important thing that we can relate to. It's also going to um, uh, you know, be an, an important factor when it comes to uh, the ecology of different kinds of organisms. And when it comes to this, uh, this sweaty guy, right? Um, what's going on here, it's a little bit different because when water goes from a liquid phase into a vapor, Right? We call it uh, the heat of vaporization, right? It takes a lot of energy, right? Uh, the water in a liquid form turns into a gas, but in the process of doing that, it has to absorb lots of heat energy, lots of thermal energy. And so uh, when you evaporate water, you're also taking away with the, with the vapor lots of heat, which is why water is such a really good material to sweat, right? You can, uh, you can get a lot more cooling by vaporizing water than you can by vaporizing a non-polar liquid. Okay. So that's um, another feature of water. Now, you know, thinking about it again, you, you have uh, cohesive properties of water. Uh, we, we use um, you know, trees as a good example of how water's cohesive properties are important. Uh, if water did not stick to each other, then you wouldn't be able to pull uh, water molecules all the way up to a tall tree. Water molecules simply separate right, under low pressure. Water molecules don't separate. In fact, water molecules can, can be drawn up to the very top of a coastal redwood tree 
and that's like over 100 meters tall. And so, uh, yeah, water molecules are pretty important that way. Uh, you've got surface tension, you've got um, this characteristic of heat of vaporization, and, and these are all related to those that feature of hydrogen bonding between the water molecules. Okay. Um, the other cool uh, diagram that we have here is the polar bear. Uh, and, and this is another really crazy property of water that has got a lot of significance. Now, you know, most things, when you uh, lower their temperature, when they get colder and colder and colder, the molecules tend to pack tighter and tighter. In other words, now if the molecules of water were to pack tighter and tighter, it would get more dense and it would tend to sink, right? But water does this really funny thing when it freezes, when it goes into a solid phase. When it goes into a solid phase, the hydrogen bonds between the water molecules kind of take over and they form this lattice structure in which the molecules are spaced more widely compared to how they're spaced in liquid water. And consequently, ice, when it forms, is less dense and it floats on top of the water. Okay? Now, you might not think that this is terribly uh, important, but it actually is because you know it's it's actually true that if ice did not float, then you wouldn't have uh, sheets of ice forming on top of lakes during the winter. Uh, and because and once the ice forms on top of the lake, it's very reflective. And so the water underneath is basically protected by a thermal blanket that's on top, right? Uh, remember that the air temperature above the lake is really cold during the winter, right? And so if you had um, liquid water turning to a solid phase and sinking to the bottom, then you would continually have solid water ice forming, it would continually sink to the bottom and pretty soon a lake would freeze completely solid, which would be, uh, which would be terrible for the fish. And um, it would get to the point where you know, there would be some lakes that would never even unfreeze during the summer. And, and so you know, the, the fact that we've got this pretty um, moderately temperature, uh, moderate temperatures on the world, Part of that's because we're mostly covered with water. Oceans cover about four fifths of the Earth's surface, and uh, the water covers four fifths of the Earth's surface. And therefore, we've got relatively little uh, dry land. And so, the dry land that we do have is re remains habitable because of the thermal properties of water, and it uh, it remains liquid water because of this weird tendency of water to float when it freezes. I, I, honestly, I, that is uh, one of the more spectacular things that you can think about today. And uh, let's go back to our little um, agenda, make sure that we covered everything. Uh, yep, 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 yep. And we're down here at the bottom. Remarkable properties of water due entirely to the interaction between water molecules and other water molecules, due entirely to this phenomenon of hydrogen bonds, right? Cohesion surface tension, high specific heat, high heat of vaporization, those are the thermal properties of water, and expansion of freezing. That is the uh, phenomenon that gives us floaty ice as opposed to sinky ice, which would be really bad for the fish. All right, uh, one more lecture in this uh, module, and then uh, we're done. See you soon.